bunch of people gathering on a small platform, standing incredibly close together. That's a good one to look temporarily and share. And the question is, can you substitute? Can you replace that activity with something else? The next level up is engineering controls. Could we increase, for example, the amount of ventilation in our dining hall? Or administrative controls? Could we shrink the cohort size from 20 people in a group to 10? And what would that look like? And the final level being some of the protective equipment. Now, just to give you a background on some of the activities that I do, my grandfather and father and uncle and I are all square dance scholars. It's been part of my family's history for generations. But I can tell you that in the middle of a global pandemic, square dancing may not be the ideal activity. Lots of personal contact between the dancers. You can see they're not masking, indoor location. There's lots of reasons to be concerned. The good news is square dancing is not the only kind of dancing. Here's a group doing socially distant line dancing. I don't necessarily think that line dancing and square dancing are the same thing, but I think it gives us an opportunity to have some of the same elements. And that's when I realized this, that the goal of a physically distant activity is not to replicate a non-physically distant activity, but rather to replicate the outcome. Square dancing and line dancing, they're not the same thing. But since we can't do square dancing, at least we can do line dancing and have that community feel of dancing together. Let me give you another example of a real life situation. One of my favorite ice breaking activities using a raccoon circle is an activity called twice around the block. I take a piece of webbing, I tie a knot in it, and the fellow who's holding the knot above his head in a second will let go, he's the speaker. And as he introduces himself to the group, the rest of the group is gonna move their hands and move that knot around the circle. When it comes the first time, that's once around the block. When it comes around the second time, game over. Now, that activity has a lot of concern to it. Close proximity, you can see people are elbow to elbow. This is a large group, there's over 12 people in this particular group. And they came from other groups that were in the same room. Close proximity, indoor location, they're using a shared resource that everybody's touching. There's a lot of reasons to be concerned here. So I modified the activity. First thing I did was get rid of the raccoon circle. Now I don't have any concerns about people touching the same prop. I shrunk the size of the group from 12 to six. And I put five people inside of a circle in physically distant fashion. And the sixth person now walks twice around the perimeter. So I was able to keep the phrase twice around the block. It still has relevance, but I was able to mitigate some of the biggest concerns of the activity, like shared resources and close proximity. And what I really like about this is some of the new ways are better than the old ways. One thing I discovered was there were no guidelines currently for letting me know which activities are appropriate and which ones should I not use. So I created my own list. And in my list, if you can answer yes to two or more of these questions, then you've identified an activity that either A, needs to be modified so it can be safer, or B, needs to be temporarily eliminated. And that's an important word, temporarily. Not forever, not permanently, but just for now. So let's consider a couple of real life cases. Group juggle, close proximity of the participants, shared resources, everybody touches everything. In my book, two strikes and you're out. Now in some parts of the world, they like this activity. It's a common one to use with school groups. And they say, well, we don't really want to shelve the activity. So what can we do to modify it? And these are from some friends of mine who are in Singapore. They mask and glove, use hand washing. They sanitize the equipment in between groups. And when they're done, they take off their gloves and they use hand sanitizer and they go on to the next activity. In North America, I've seen a fair amount of social distancing and, and mask wearing, but I really haven't seen a lot of glove use, at least in programs like this. But this was one group's alternative. And this idea came from their staff. I have a handshake activity that has a series of hilly, silly handshake as an icebreaker. And you can see close proximity, physical contact between the people. Again, two strikes and we're out. But I love the activity and I love the way it engages a group. So I looked online and I came up with a whole collection of non-contact greetings from around the world. Things that you can do so I can actually replicate the activity in a slightly different fashion and get the same outcome. I can use it with non-contact fashion. 
here's a women's field hockey team and they are playing a version of the pipeline activity where we've supersized the equipment. You can see they're wearing masks, they're socially distancing, they're wearing gloves, and they've taken those little PVC channels from about 18 inches to over six and a half feet in length. Now they can physically distance. And this idea was generated by the staff of this program. Here's another one. There was a group doing some slacklining training and they wanted to find a way to spot without physical contact. So they use this PVC pole that can be sanitized between groups. So I inform the staff of what the guidelines are because sometimes they come up with a really creative solution so we can modify the activity in a way to make it acceptable and safe. In fact, it's no better time than to implement some of your staff's best ideas. So what's this future gonna look like? Here's a picture from a recent Texas Rangers baseball game. This was the first one that allowed full capacity. And you can see a cross section of America in this one picture. Some people are masked, some people are not masked, some people are partially masked, I'm not sure what that does. This is what our future is gonna look like. It's a brilliant time in America for a little tolerance and it's based upon something we're all familiar with in the adventure-based learning field, the comfort zone model. What's your personal comfort? Now on Thursday of this week, I'm gonna get on an airplane for the first time in 14 months. And I gotta tell you, I'm a little nervous about that experience. So my comfort zone is probably gonna to be to overdo the safety aspect. Am I gonna wear a mask? You bet I am. Am I gonna you know, use hand sanitizer and things on a regular basis and not eat in community spaces? Probably all those things. So when it comes down to physical distancing, we need to be prepared. And one of my friends in Boston was, he had a real world in-person event. So he went and got some armbands, wristbands, and he created these three categories. Take a red wristband if you'd like to maintain distance. If you're okay with talking but not touching, grab a yellow one. And he says, high fives and hugs are okay with me. Now you can tell as you approach people in a group what their comfort level is. And I really like this technique as people get to choose. But all I'm trying to do in this presentation is this. I wanna turn your staff into risk managers, every member of them. Now, some of you have a, a separate person and their whole, their whole job is risk management. But by getting every member of your staff acquainted with the various procedures and on the lookout for them, I think good things are gonna happen. So what can we do? Well, let me give you this idea. When I first started doing team building, I took an index card and I made a list of 10 things that I thought I could do well. That was my starter list. And over the years, I've added to that list to the point where I now have a three ring binder with lots of pages in it and probably several thousand activities inside there. But there are just two pages in that binder with my absolute favorite activities. So I started with that list, my favorite things to do with groups. And from my list of maybe two or 300, I was able to choose 75 activities, either as is or with slight modification that did two important things. Number one, they created a sense of connection and contact, or, um, community between people. And number two, I could do them, again, either as is or with slight modification in a physically distant fashion. So I put together this book called Connection Without Contact. And some of those activities now appear on this website, on the Kikori app. So you can find that information there as well. I put the stick people that you're used to seeing, but my stick people are having more fun than the standard stick people, I think. Also, I had a lot of camp directors and youth development specialists and medical staff who said, there's a lot of other cool things you can do. So here's another list of more than 100 things that you can do when you have groups together while physical distancing. In Singapore, for example, I've got friends that teach there and paddle boarding has exploded during the time of the pandemic. You can do it while physically distancing and get you outside. There's a social component to it. People love paddle boarding. When I first started working at camp, one of my unique skills was I could throw and catch boomerangs. And I got to tell you, when you throw boomerangs, you really don't want people standing right next to you. So some activities lend themselves to social distancing. It's also a great idea for no prop activities. Perfect time for this, because at the end of the activity, there's nothing that's sanitized for the next group. Now, on the warning side, physical distancing takes more space. Most camps notice this because of their dining hall. They physically don't have enough room to feed everybody while socially distancing. So they're either feeding in shifts or they move things outside. And that's okay. 
You just need to be aware of that. What you need to be aware of is there's nothing written in stone. And what I mean by that is if you look at the current CDC guidelines, they are significantly different than they were in January. So in just a few months, things can change. And as the summer progresses and the number of vaccinations increase and the cases go down, I think we're going to see a change in a lot of policies. So be ready for that. We all learned how to pivot last year. We need to be ready for that same level. And what's that future going to look like? Well, I'm still waiting for those flying cars we were promised. I, I was pretty sure by 2020 we should have them. But I think one of the things you're going to see in the world is hybrid programming. There's going to be a return to do some real world in-person events. There's going to be a continuation of some of the cool things we learn how to do virtually. I think it's not surprising that in the future, you might have 80% of your participants at a conference in person and another 20% accessing virtually. So all those things are gonna exist. And for people like us who facilitate groups, who work with groups, our ability to maintain our relevance is based upon our ability to do all these things. So a couple of things I just wanna share with you as I close up my time here, and I'll turn it back to Brennan in just a second. There's a brilliant surgeon and he's performing a surgery and he's being assisted by this one intern. And at the end of the surgery, the intern turns to him and says, I noticed doctor, when you finished up, um, with a patient, you tied four sutures to, to close up the patient. But the book on this procedure that you wrote says that only three are required. I'm curious about that fourth one. And the doctor says, yeah, he says, I tie the fourth one because it helps me sleep at night. <laughs> and the reason I bring that up is I want you to sleep well. When you get back to doing real world in-person programs, I'm encouraging you to err on the side of greater safety. If you're wondering if you've done enough, then perhaps you haven't. And I want you to sleep well this summer. So as we return to the more opportune um, events that bring people together in person, be as safe as you possibly can. It's a good time to overdo it. Not forever, but for the immediate future, great things happen. And I'll give you a kind of analogy of that. Let's do the YMBA area that's near their community and they decided to run camp and they did as much as they could correctly. They brought staff in for two weeks of staff training. They quarantined them. They tested people. In the end, they ended up with multiple hundreds of cases of COVID. They tried their best, but they weren't successful. So I would encourage you this year to overdo it a little bit on the safety aspect. We'll eventually get back to whatever the new normal looks like but I'm encouraging you to be as safe as possible. And I think you'll sleep better at night if you do. So Bryn, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Hey Bryn, you're muted. I know, yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, if somebody has their Zoom bingo card out and uh, talking while muted hasn't been checked off, you can go ahead and mark that one down. Um, <laughs> so thanks so much for sharing that, Jim. Um, I, you guys, I went and got Jim's books, this one and uh, the Dutchman's Rope, um, and have been looking through them and there's so much good stuff in here. You can get them either on Amazon or on the American Camping Association website. Um, and the... Um, what I love about these, and I just found this out today, Jim, is that Play for Peace gets um, a portion of some books that use Raccoon Circle content. Um, Sweet. So Play for Peace is um, a founding partner of Kikori. So yay. Um, they are, are one of our social impact initiatives and um, I love, I love supporting them as well. So you guys should go and do that. And um, so what I wanted to share with you guys is a little bit more about Kikori. And I know some of you are familiar with this. I was trying to ask my computer to do less while I was getting all the video because in the woods in northern Wisconsin, sometimes uh, 
my internet gets choppy. So um, about Kikori. So Kikori is a web app. Um, well, it's a mobile and a desktop app. We released the desktop version in February, but we transform education by providing easy access to quality experiential education and social emotional learning activities. Part of that quality um, is is content by experienced authors like Jim. So how can we deepen learning? A lot of us know that that concrete experience, that's going to happen. But through reflective observation, abstract conceptualization, and active experimentation, we know that we can deepen learning and capitalize on those gains. And those are a little bit of abstract words that might not be super familiar to you, but this, this model might. So it's the what, so what, now what? There's a lot of curriculum resources out there that provide the concrete experience, but they don't follow you through that experiential learning cycle. They don't close that gap and they don't really push both the educator and the student to do the, the thought process of now what are we gonna do with that information? So <clears throat> everything on Kikori has a play, reflect, connect, learn. And we meet the facilitator where they're at. If you're not comfortable debriefing, we provide those questions for you. If you're seasoned and you don't need that nudge, then please keep doing what you're doing. We love what you're doing. Um, but sometimes people need um, just a, a prompt or two. And so we really make sure that all of our content is vetted in that way. Um, key features are being able to discover and search, save and organize, create, publish and share. And I'll, I'll plug it in and show you guys. So um, I'm really excited. And I know some of you guys may have seen an original version of the app and things are happening. Um, if you have any extra thoughts and prayers available, um, I would appreciate those to my development team because we are working with a couple of folks over in India and uh, they're, they're having a rough go of it right now. So, um, but they've, they've helped uh, me and Kendra make this beautiful app. And so when you, when you come in here and the app, the mobile app is available on both of the app stores, Google Play app store, or you can log in through your desktop. But you come here and this is the activity homepage. Um, you can see all these recently added activities. But for those of you guys who are still doing virtual or hybrid programming, we've got a bunch of virtual activities. Um, and all of them are written so that you don't have to figure out how to do that adaptation. This is a really great product if you think you have to pivot back and forth. And I think I saw somebody in Ontario um, in the chat. I don't know if you're still here, but gosh, Ontario is on their third lockdown. Um, and so what that's doing to that social connection of folks, it's just heartbreaking. And to think of all the learning losses and the student um, community base, it just breaks my heart. Um, but so here you can, it's a one-stop shop for virtual and then activities that can be done while safely physical distancing. So here's all of Jim's content that's on here, but you can browse by category or follow the, the author. And then you can get notifications every time they upload new content. <clears throat> so if you click in to an activity, you can see this is an energizer, three lightning bolts of energy, it takes about 15 minutes or so. Um, general overview, some materials, attributes, and all of those things are things that you can search for. Um, but here are the instructions, easy to follow, play, reflection questions, um, and then the source. So it's really great to run through the activity. If you're in a pinch, let's say, you know, it's 
the last few days of school and you are just tired of teaching and you're tired of coming up with content and your kids are just being squirrely. So come on here, say, I need to burn 15 minutes. I need a three energy activity. Say I'm teaching middle school boys. They're all hormonal. Um, it's going to give you, look at, there's a bunch of new tag games. So maybe they're tired of playing the same old tag games, but this one by Tara Flippo, um, <clears throat> it's part of her social emotional learning and action book. And her entire book is on the app. Um, and it is organized in three sec three segmented options so that you can follow her lesson plan. But here you can just jump in here and use it. Um, it gives you a safety check, some facilitation tips, and you can use it in the moment. Let's say that you're planning for the week ahead and you have the time to sort of look through stuff. Say maybe I, I want, I want a 25 minute activity. It doesn't need to be super energetic, but I'm going to go into Castle's SEL standards and say that I really want my group to work on teamwork and relationship building. So all of Castle's standards are in here and you can search by them. And here it's going to give you some more activities. So you can find stuff Traffic Jam is a problem solver. I wouldn't recommend you just do this on a whim with a group that's never done stuff before, um, but Jim knows. And uh, you can use this either by making your own Dutchman's rope that Jim talked about, or if you've got poly spots, or even I've seen people do it with just like post-it notes or pieces of paper. So um, Traffic Jam is, is a great activity that we have um, at Manitouish on our low ropes course, um, but it doesn't have to be a low ropes activity, but you can find everything that you need here in the app. And then another thing that's great is that you can order it into playlists. So you can use this to create curriculum. So connection without content. Um, these, these are Jim's activities sequenced in an order, um, all put together in one place. Whereas um, Kendra and I, we had somebody from the University of New Hampshire call us and they said, hey, I'm doing a thing with college undergrads. They've been virtual all year. We finally get to be in person. Can you come up with a fun sequence for us to do to like end the year on a high note that they, they remember the year that we debrief things, but that is done while safely physical distancing. And so based on that phone call, Kendra created this playlist and she could hit this share button and she shared it over to her professor in Grant. Let's see. Oh, he's not a creator. Well, she was able to share it over to him. And uh, so you can share the playlist with somebody else. So maybe Analia, who is our very new intern, maybe she hasn't seen it yet. So I can send that over to her. And then as our intern, maybe she could make some edits if there's something that's missing. But you can then share this with your grade level teams. Um, if you are running a program at a camp and let's say you've got 100 campers, you want them to have a similar experience, but we know best practices doesn't put 100 campers in the same group. So you're spreading them out to eight, eight to 12 different groups, but you can come up with a sequence. You can push that to your counselors and you can make sure that everybody has a similar experience. We know that every facilitator has their own style, but this helps streamline and guarantee that you're meeting goals and outcomes. Um, so, that is a quick overview of the app. And I'm so excited that there's such great uh, stuff on here. Um, and I would like to open the floor these last couple of minutes for questions, comments. I mean, Jim is a fantastic research resource for best practices, the things that he's seeing around the country, the things that I'm seeing. Um, 
and you guys have us, you know, for the next little while. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, I don't have a question, but I do want to say thank you for your expertise and for the research that you've done and the things that you've thought about. I'm still wrapping my head around a challenge course that I have to run that I'm not quite sure how it's going to happen. So thanks for thinking ahead for me. You are welcome. <laughs> So much of what happens on a ropes car is not so much a high where there is the physical distancing you need, but a lot of the low elements require spotting. And quite frankly, they're in that category of things that need to be temporarily suspended um, or, or modified to a way to make them a little bit safer, um, which is challenging if that's your whole frame of mind. But, but here's the good news. Like I said, some of the new ways are better. So mm -hmm. encourage your staff to come up with creative ways to use any of that stuff. Um, years ago, People used to do the spider web, for example, and they were passing people through the spider web. And then somebody came up with the idea of passing a rope through it. And suddenly we thought, wow, what, what a neat variation that was. That's the kind of thing that can happen this year. People can take the same piece of equipment and find a way to use it in a brand new way. And then we're gonna be reading your book and finding out all the cool things that you figured out how to do. Because trust me, people wanna know how to do that. And that's, that's another um, part of the app is that you can create your own activities or you can submit variations of things. We are doomed to repeat the same mistakes unless we build our collective knowledge. And if the pandemic has proven anything, it's that you guys are resilient and creative and kicking butt. Like we are making things happen. And so I want to be able to collect that knowledge by sharing that content on this platform. So if there's an activity that you're doing that is knocking it out of the park, I wanna hear about it. Um, I want you to submit it. Um, we will go through sort of a, an editing process before it goes live on the app, but then you can share it for everyone to see. Um, there's a couple of really cool opportunities if you are doing any sort of professional development or working with other grownups um, and you have a bunch of content and the app seems like a good house for that, um, like what Play for Peace does, reach out to me because we can create, I would love to create a relationship where there's some win-wins there. Also, if your staff, um, you and your staff want an organizational membership for this. Um, I would love to be able to share that with you as well. Um, I can actually throw up another graphic real quick. Um, but before I lose it, I saw a comment from Paulina. So Paulina, your video is off and you are on mute, but hopefully you are listening. Um, you asked about folks with disabilities. And there are a bunch of activities on the app, specifically the ones from Lori Frank that have um, adaptations and variations. And we are playing around with some universal design stuff. So we just added a bunch of new attributes that you can filter for, including um, universal design, including different uh, academic filters. We have high ropes, low ropes. We have equine. <laughs> there was a request from a group of, of equine therapeutic um, folks that are adding stuff. And if you filter for something and there's no content, that means I need you and your ideas. So um, I would love, I would love, love, love to see how creative you guys can be as a collective. What other questions, concerns, what, what's going on with you guys? Oh, Mary, you looked like you were gonna say something. Oh, it's Kelly, do it. I was just gonna say, I thought it was, um funny because uh, I think Jim mentioned like the spike and paddle boarding and that's one of the activities we decided to go with this summer um, because they'll take the kids uh, uh, usually rafting um, but instead oops um, 
sorry, my video shut off. But anyway, but instead we're we're trying out paddle boarding and seeing how that goes, and also tubing. So nice. Figured that way, and then the stuff can just be sprayed down afterwards. There we go. Well, and in Texas, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Up here, I feel like a lot of times it would be like mildly hypothermic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For sure. Um. Yeah, I don't know about um, other places. I was trying to just look it up right now on the CDC, but we've had um, uh, recommendations now that uh, children can be within three feet or like uh, just three feet of distance. Is that the same for everybody else? Okay. Yeah. Odds. I didn't know because I, I know like Michigan, former residents, uh, is doing really poorly. So I didn't know how... Um, other places were having the recommendations, but they- Kelly, the new guidelines for the CDC, and, and again, they got updated on April 24th. Um, so if you have the January ones, you need to download the most recent. Say that cohort groups, mm. groups can gather at a physical distance of three feet. Okay. But not when they're eating. It's back to yes, six Yeah, feet. I saw that. And yeah, adults, staff or staff or just adults in general can't, st are still supposed to be six feet from everyone. Yeah, and cohorts should be six feet from other cohorts too. Yeah. So, but, but the nice thing is if you've got a, you know, an intact group that you're going to have for, you know, a period of time, that feels a little nicer to have that, that level of intimacy and, and closeness, which, like I said, that's, that's part of why we get together, I think. Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting um the idea of cohorting um and can you really cohort if your program is like a single day um and does that really count as like a cohort or is that you know just a group hanging out for you know I feel like in order to have the benefits of cohorting it needs to be an extended um program really otherwise there's no difference between just a bunch of people hanging out I don't know except uh, for the pre-screening beforehand I think the idea of cohorting too is also for contract tracing and things like that. And if there is an outbreak, you've minimized the spread. So even for single day programs, it probably still makes sense to do that. And it's, I know it's not ideal because sometimes, you know, all the icebreakers and things I do are intended to get people intermixing and meeting each other. And so, you know, we still do that, but in a pale version of what it once was, but that's, mm -hmm. that's the current level of standards. And, People are going to ask, you know, did you follow the guidelines? And that's the current guidelines. So I'm willing to work within that. We just have to be a little bit more creative. Let me give you an example. One group said, our dining hall, there is no way. We don't have the ventilation. We can't meet that many people. So they brought in food trucks for one meal. They have picnic baskets with blankets so four people can eat together. They're doing dinner under the stars on the basketball court. They set up tables. So they made the alternative to the old dining hall really attractive and fun so that people wanted to do these things. They have a smoothie truck that shows up in the afternoon and makes smoothies for each other. Um, they have a snack truck that drives around to the different sites and kids can have snacks. So it's like they found ways not within their dining hall, but to do it in a way that met the current guidelines. And it was fun. So that's the kind of innovation I think we're on the cusp of learning more about. I'll give you one more example. In North Dakota, there's an oncology camp for children with cancer called Camp Case. Everybody sleeps in cabins, but one night during the stay, your cabin has a turn to sleep out under the stars. And they have a bonfire, they make s'mores, and they camp under the stars. They said, we're going to do that with everybody this year. Anybody can sleep out anytime they want because it reduces the number of people in the cabins. And it gives you a chance to sleep under the stars. And they made it a cool thing. And kids like to do it anyway. So what fun that was. So I think, like I said, get your staff involved, show them what the guidelines are, and then ask them how to be creative. Because some of us might be running out of our creative juice a little bit, but your staff, I'm sure, will have ideas, especially if they don't want to give up an activity that's near and dear to them. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts at, or questions? Yeah. At, at Camp Manitowish, we have a, a day called Paul Bunyan Day or Pauline Bunyan Day during uh, girls camp. And uh, there's a silent meal. And that now is a very COVID attractive thing. Um, <laughs> that people are not talking and, and breathing on people as they're eating. 
I know that the Paul Newman camps, so they used to be called Hole of the Wall, and now they have a new name, Serious Fun. Um, they have no utensil spaghetti night. And mm. you eat spaghetti with no forks or silverware, you know, and it's, and it's an absolute mess. But there's just certain things that, that they do that people just get excited about that. And I, and I want you to be prepared for that because some of the cool things you're going to learn this year are going to be different than they were in the past. And some of them are going to be better. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Jim, real quick. Um, first off, I'm so excited. I've never seen your upper lip. This is amazing for me right now. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a mustache for a lot of years. <laughs> totally, totally throw me off right now. Um, <laughs> um, of of your books, you just went through like you know the fifteen that you banged out this year. Um, what would be you know so specifically thinking distancing and programming with groups of varying sizes? Where would you recommend you know if I had a smaller budget? I'll tell you three, uh, and again, Amazon, th this is the one I put together that has not only games and activities, but best practices. And a lot of directors and youth development people and medical professionals wrote chapters in here. So it gives you activities and best practices. And, and again, my stick people are having more fun than most stick people. Um, I wrote a thing on the Dutchman's Rope and that's on the Kikori app now too. Um, the idea was, I just wanted to share a really simple technique if you're having trouble maintaining physical distance, you can give one of these to your staff. They can throw the circle out and play lots of circle games. And that's that's inexpensive um, as well. And then a friend of mine, I'm just going to share a screen one last time. A friend of mine, Martin Williams from the UK, we wrote this book. Um, he wrote these original books called Games to Play Whilst Socially Distancing. And I wanted the idea because I'll never get the word whilst into a title unless I work with somebody from the UK. But collectively, we put together this book, which hit Amazon yesterday. Um, and the idea is games and practices. And I can tell you, Martin's been doing early childhood development, three to seven-year-olds, for more than 20 years. And some of his games were a riot. I'm absolutely going to use them this year. So I learned that's, that's an ideal co-author for me. So those are the three that I'm aware of that have a lot of the physical distancing stuff. They incorporate the best practices. And they're fun. I mean, I'm not sure what more you can have. And I'd say probably in each of those books, at least a third of them require no props at all. And the props that are required are either easy to sanitize or things like index cards, which you can recycle afterwards and not have to worry about um, you know, sanitizing after they're used. Excellent. Hope that answers your question. Totally. Thank you so much. You bet. Well, after this event, um, like I said, I'm, I'm glad to share the, uh, the presentation. And I know Bryn's available too. You can email each of us, ask more questions um, after the fact, or we can schedule a time to chat. And um, I see there's one question from Dave Mitchell. Hmm. Oh. I love debriefing. And I didn't used to. I used to get really like nervous about it. Or I used it as like an opportunity to pontificate, um, which I've had to pull back from. Um, if you're in person, have them find something in nature that related to what happened during the last activity. Um, you know, and it can be something they pick up or just something that they have eyes on. Um, you can always use uh, debriefing cards and just be the only person that touches them. Um, I know some folks have like laminated stuff or there's a waterproof spot it card deck um, and waterproof like Uno cards. And so if you search on Amazon for waterproof cards, those ones are easier to wipe down um, and sanitize. I know Michelle has said that you can sanitize like her thumb balls, but I think it does start to wear on the integrity of the ball. Um, but yeah, I love, yes, no prop debriefing. No prop debriefing is, is sometimes best. Um, that or having um, we talk about it, you talk about it, Jim, in, in the books, and it's sort of a raccoon circle, but whoever has the knot 
um, like talks and then you stop it. But there's also one of the modifications that we're uploading onto Kikori is uh, where you wrapped around my finger. So you debrief for as long as the string is around your finger. Once the string is wrapped around your finger, then you're done talking. But while the string is actively being wound around your finger, you have the floor. Um, and those are really great options because it gives the participant something tangible to focus on and the rest of the participants something tangible to focus on. So they're all not like looking each other in the eyes and being like, tell me about your feelings, um, which puts people on the spot and makes them not as, um, as open sometimes. Um, I like the wrapped around my finger idea. And if you'd like to avoid community property, I literally have people pull out their shoelace. Mm. And you can do exactly the same things and it's only theirs. And when they're mm -hmm. done, they can reinsert it in their shoes and move on. And you don't have to worry about sharing equipment or some of those kind of things. Now, if everybody's wearing Crocs, it's a little more challenging. If I use the debriefing thumb ball and I'm the only person that throws it up and I have them put their hands behind their back and pick a number, you know, so, hey, one, maybe that's how I do mm. it. Because the debriefing thumb ball is pretty cool. Yeah, I love that, Katrina. That's great. I was going to say, if you're doing the raccoon circles, like you were saying, Bryn, instead of ha physically holding a raccoon circle, just have everybody like put a spot down and have everybody rotate around in the circle. Mm -hmm. So you're still maintaining your distance, but whoever happens to land on that spot is the one that gets to go. If you want to go that route. Yeah, I think that's written up as like shuffle, shuffle left or shuffle right. Exactly. Yeah, it works really well for ADD people like yeah. myself. <laughs> Who needs some motion to contemplate their thoughts? Absolutely. <laughs> Kinesthetic. I, I have some kids that when they sit down, they shut down. So keeping them in motion is a great idea. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we've hit the top of the hour, but you know, I believe in happy hours. So Britt and I are going to hang out for a little bit longer. You've gotten the content you need. And uh, if you'd like to stick around and chat, we're happy to do so for a few more minutes. But thanks so much. And uh, like I said, I encourage you to sleep well this summer by doing more than the minimum to make sure that you and your staff and your, your participants are safe. So have a great summer. Um, this next phase of our lives in the recovery mode after a, a global pandemic, um, we, the world so much needs what we know how to do. So good luck, take care and uh, be safe out there. And keep in touch because to, to facilitate all alone um, is sometimes hard on our hearts too. So make sure that you are finding your own community in other facilitators and, and we're always here. So thank you for coming this afternoon. I really appreciate it.